I'm showing you fine, Ruth, Vanessa, cool. All right. So good morning. Uh, thank you all for joining us for this event, Decolonizing Methodologies, Black, Indigenous and Women of Colour Perspectives. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land that we meet on today. For me, as a researcher at the Monash Clayton campus, that is the people of the Kulin Nations. I would like to also acknowledge all the different Aboriginal lands that our panellists, as well as our attendees across Australia, are meeting on today and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. We also warmly welcome all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who are present in today's webinar. Welcome. We would also like to begin today's session by acknowledging all the panellists and attendees of this event who are currently in lockdown due to COVID-19. This is a stressful, uncertain time, and so we thank you for being here today, for giving us your energy, your passion, and your perspectives. We're really grateful. My name is Claire, and I'm a member of the Taza Mem postgraduate team and the chair for today's session. Today's conversations about is a, co a collaboration between the Australian Sociological Association's Migration, Ethnicity and Multiculturalism thematic group and African Women Australia. We are delighted to have the Director of Research from African Women Australia, Dr. Virginia Mapedzahama, here with us today. Virginia will tell us a little bit about African Women Australia during her presentation, and I'll also provide their website details in the chat box so you can learn more about the incredible work that they are doing. We are absolutely thrilled to present this MEM Conversations About panel, Decolonizing Methodologies, Black, Indigenous and Women of Colour Perspectives today. The MEM Conversations About online series has been running since early 2020 with the aim to provide postgraduate students and early career researchers with the opportunity to engage more deeply with contemporary migration research challenges. Today's panel has a personal genesis for me. When I first began my PhD three years ago, I was unaware as to how my positionality as a white, middle-class Australian woman would impact my research with African-Australian young people. Now, as I come to the end of my PhD, I look back on this naivety and I'm incredibly grateful to the mentorship of people like Virginia, who's also my uh, PhD supervisor, thank you, Virginia, and for the articles, books, presentations, social media posts written by women of colour, who have called out the privileging of whiteness in research and urged us to do better. We hope that the perspectives shared here today encourage all of us to be critical of how we can be better researchers, better allies, and how we can be more supportive of the communities that we care so deeply about, communities who are so often silenced, excluded, and alienated in Australia. In learning about best practice to decolonize methodologies, it is important that we hear from the people whose perspectives matter the most. Thus, the contention for today's panel is to centre and elevate the perspectives of Black, Indigenous and women of colour. In doing so, we acknowledge that there is already a huge amount of labour and energy that Black, Indigenous and women of colour already give, not only to these debates, but also to their lived experiences. And so we really thank our panellists for giving us their time, energy and patience today. Before I introduce our panels, I would like to outline just very quickly how today's session will run. Each panelist has been given the challenge to present for about 10 minutes. Um, so as we go, please feel free to add your questions to the chat box on the right hand side of your screen. At the end of all of the presentations, we're gonna hopefully have about 20 minutes, maybe a bit more for Q&A, which we'll compile from the chat box. Any questions that do not get answered here today, we're more than happy to share with the panelists and hopefully we'll get those answered at a later date for you. Today's session will be recorded. Uh, with the aim to share it to those with those who couldn't be with us. So uh, please turn your camera off if you do not want your image to be captured. Okay, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our incredible panel. So first up is Dr. Virginia Mapadzahama, who is a critical race, black feminist researcher, whose research focuses on understanding the social construction or all categories of difference, meanings attached to this difference, how it is signified and lived, as well as its implications for those assigned difference. She explores this interest in the context of subjective experiences of migration, diaspora, blackness, race, race and ethnicity, sexuality, and gendered violence. Welcome, Virginia. Dr. Vanessa Lee Ahmat from the Yapangathian to Meriam Nation resides in the land of the Gadigal people. She is a social epidemiologist, poet, cultural connector, and public health and health sciences researcher within the discipline of behavioral and social sciences in the Faculty of Medicine Health at the University of Sydney. Her research focuses on indigenous peoples, LGBT populations and health and wellness. Welcome, Vanessa. Thank you. 
Dr. Ruth Faleolo is a New Zealand-born Tongan, Australian-based Pacifica researcher of Pacific people's migration histories, trans-Pacific mobilities, collective agencies, and multi-sited Pacific e-cultivation of cultural heritage. Ruth's current postdoctoral study considers Pacific mobilities to and through Australia and supports a larger ARC-funded study, Indigenous mobilities to and through Australia, agency and sovereignties. Welcome, Ruth. And finally, Dr. Sunshine Camelloni is a writer, advocate and researcher whose research interests centre center around cultural anxieties about race and bridging the gap between theory and lived experience. Sunshine's book, Understanding Racism in a Post-Racial World, explores the interactions of race and bodies in everyday situations. Welcome, Sunshine. Wow, what a panel. If you haven't already, please check out their Google Scholar profiles. Please read their research. I'm happy to provide some links in the chat box for you. Uh, without further ado, let's kick things off. Virginia, let me um, screen share your slides and we can get going whenever you are ready. Um, Okay, can everyone see the slides? Is that okay, yeah. Virginia? Yeah, sorry about that. I think my um, connection just dropped out for a little bit, but yeah, that seems, that looks all right. Okay, um, thank you for that, um, for that introduction, Claire, and for um, setting the context for our discussions today for us. Um, before I go any further, I would also like to start by acknowledge, acknowledging that I'm calling in into this meeting from um, the land of the Wongo people of the Eora Nation. Um, the Wongo people are the owners of the land which covers um, what we now know here in Sydney as the municipality of, um, of Strathfield. Um, in the Greater Sydney area. I also humbly acknowledge that the lands which we all benefit from occupying, which I, benef which I as a non-white settler, um, also benefit from occupying were all stolen and that sovereignty was never ceded. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and the waters of Australia. This always was, is, and always will be Aboriginal land. Next slide, please. Okay, um, maybe before I get on to um, like the, the core discussion uh, for today, um, as Claire said, I will just give a, bit, a brief background um, of AWA because I'm putting my AWA we had on to today um, as the director of research. Awau is, um, and Claire, as Claire said, she'll give you the um, details at the end of the, um, or in the, in the chat function. Um, Awau is an organization for African women, sorry, Awau stands for African Women Australia Inc. Um, I know the, the acronym seems a bit, um, a bit interesting as in where's the U coming from, it's AU from Australia. Um, but it's an organization for African women by African women. It, it is an organization that was founded with the sole purpose of elevating African women's voices um, in Australia in public, public discussions at a national, regional and international level. Um, so even though it operates very much at the grassroots level at the local level the whole idea is is to 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 elevate those voices of african women not just in australia at a national level but also internationally and so some of the work that we do um is very much collaborative with some international um organization back on the uh, on the continent and um uh, across the um the globe as well um i'm always a brainchild of um juliana Nkrumah. she founded the organization in um 2005 and juliana is a nigerian australian woman um, who lives here in Sydney. So over the years, Awau has changed. It started off being just a small group of uh, women who were um, led by Julie, Juliana, who are very much interested in the experiences of, Af of African women in Australia. And at that time, it was auspiced to the Australian National Committee for Refugee Women, but it's sort of evolved over the years to become its own separate independent um, not-for-profit organization 
um, and, and the powerful com um, community organization that we are today. So it's not surprising that our mission is to ensure that the voices and the lived experiences of continental African women and their descendants in Australia um, are centered and heard. Um, I'm sure you, you, you can, you can if, you, if, if you all th uh, put your thinking caps on, um, you can sort of en envision or think of uh, how African women in media or any public discourses in Australia um, are in the large, like they're largely missing. So um, there's a tendency to talk about either called women very broadly, or sometimes even um, women of color broadly, um, without actually really going in to understand what the specific experiences of African women are. So they tend to be spoken for rather, uh, or spoken to or about, rather than um, having their voices heard. Um, and our purpose really is to strengthen national and intellectual capacity or of African on African women in Australia, and we we try and do this by being the hub for the most comprehensive, up to date, and Afrocentric information about African women in Australia. And how do we do this? Well, we do this by applying an approach that's uh, method methodologically, theoretically, uh, and philosophically pluralist, and it incorporates like African feminisms, Black feminisms, um, feminist intersectional theory. Um, human rights approaches, um, Ubuntu African philosophy, and um, a variety of Afrocentric approaches, as well as post-colonialism. Um, so we really are all about operating within that Afrocentric strength-based human rights framework that emphasizes the centrality um, of the voices of African people or people of African descent. So for us, being Afrocentric in our work means that we strive to ensure that the issues of national relevance, particularly those directly affecting and that are of significance to African women, are viewed from the perspectives of African women themselves. And when we use a strength-based approach, that enables us also to focus on African women's self-determination, their strengths, their positive attributes and contributions to the Australian society. It also means that we, we're really striving to provide counter-narrative to current um, deficit discourses, which only focus on the limitations um, and, and those negative aspects of African women and their families in Australia. I don't need to go... Um, into this too much. Um, so really our work, like I said at the beginning, is for African women, by African women. It's guided by and informed by African women themselves and we do it th through um, like uh, extensive grassroots engagement with African women and African communities in Australia. So when you really think about it, um, our agenda really is one of decolonizing narratives of um, African womanhood um, in Australia. And so for us, when we um, think about or talk about decolonizing methodologies, uh, one thing uh, really stands out. And Claire, if you can move to the next slide, please. Um, so when we're talking about decolonizing um, methodologies, what what we perceive is that this actually starts with the self. It starts with decolonizing yourself. And that's what I'm going to talk about um, today um, for the next, I don't know, five minutes maybe is all I have left. <laughs> um, and I, I, I really want to um, kind of highlight um, what I've got in there in bold in that um, um, statement up there. It's from this organization called No White Saviors and I strongly recommend you if you don't know that organization to go and have a look on the website or the Instagram. Um, it's a really important, uh, it's a really interesting organization in terms of thinking about, um, you know, uh, practical ways on how to decolonize um, one's mind. And so what's really important for us um, as an organization is that when you um, actually, when decolonizing oneself requires that when you're working with um, BIPOC communities, um, that you listen, you, act, you listen, like actively listen before you speak, you learn before you act, and you partner up instead of leading. So I, for us, these, those are the core issues or sort of the core um, ways in which you can actually uh, decolonize yourself. So at the core of all of this stuff really is reflexivity. 
Um, and that's that very critical way of knowing oneself and understanding your positionality in relation to, to your work. So really understanding yourself and um, what it means to be in your position, what it means to be you in relation to the work that you're doing, and particularly if you're not part of the communities that you're, um, that you're researching. And I wanna focus a little bit um, in the next slide on um, really the ways, the, some of the practical ways in which you can actually um, engage in this reflexive process. Um, and I'm, like, I'm talking about really that critical process that in, involves asking some really hard questions of yourself and of your research. So I'm probably starting here at the end because I'm starting with giving practical advice about how to actually engage reflexively with the work that you're doing in this process of decolonizing yourself. Um, on your way to decolonizing methodologies. Um, so for us, or for me uh, at least, they have kind of four key pillars, um, or let's call them like points of reflexivity that I can think of that are really key to this process of knowing oneself and decolonizing oneself that I really wanna touch on. And at the core of this, like I said um, um, at the, before, at the core of these processes or at the center of it all is just you starting with, asking yourself those really philosophical and those really critical questions of who am I and what does it mean to be who am I? So it's, it's not just asking who am I, but it's asking who am I and what does it mean to be me in relation to others, in relation to those that I'm, um, that I'm um, interested in speaking to, interested in talking to, particularly if you're not part of um, um, that specific group or your, your um, researching groups that are um, historically oppressed, historically marginalized. So what does who I am mean for how I move through this world? Um, what privileges might I have that actually give me some power um, to speak in a particular way, some power to silence as well? Because one of the things that I've um, come across in my work is when you talk to allies um, and you sort of have this critical conversation and they come to the realization that in fact, um, unwittingly, um, they've been part of um, that process of perpetuating the structural inequalities that are there um, because people don't often sit and um, have that critical critical um, reflexive process. And when I'm talking about reflexivity here, I'm talking about a process that you don't sort of do at the beginning of your project and say, I did that, it's done, I wrote a paper on it. No, we're talking about a process that is constantly ongoing. I have to engage in this process of reflexivity myself every single time, even when I'm researching my own group. Um, because you have to ask yourself those critical questions, like I said, of um, what does who I am mean for the ways that I move through this world and the privileges that I have? And what relationship do I have with these communities um, that I'm researching? And what does that mean for my research? What does that mean for the way that I speak? So you're at the center of this. And one of the pillars that, that comes out is really um, thinking about the story itself, um, the story that, that, that is being told. Whose story are you telling, right? So when you're decolonizing yourself, you have to think about well, why am I telling this story? Why me? Why now? Um, what is the current narrative around the story that, I, um, that I'm trying to tell? Um, and most importantly, what is the majoritarian narrative of this particular story and who controls that narrative? And um, what is my role in potentially participating in, my, in that majoritarian narrative and who will I automatically exclude. So thinking um, very carefully when you're decolonizing yourself or decolonizing your own mind um, about um, around the, 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 the story itself. So to decolonize the self always means that you're always constantly remembering that um, your research or any sort of research is about ethical sto uh, storytelling, like how do I ethically 
um, tell this story that is, that is not my story to tell, really. It's somebody else's story. So how do I do that ethically? And one of the things that I always emphasize when I'm talking um, in um, contexts like this is to say, you need to tell the full story, right? Because um, often people tell like pieces of the story and um, that, can be, um, that can give a different picture or be misinterpreted. Um, for those of you who are familiar with Chimamanda Ngozi's work, you know that she talks about the dangers of um, uh, a single narrative. And I urge you again to go and read that, um, read her work if you haven't already, or listen at least at the very least, at least listen to her TED talk where she talks about the dangers of a single narrative. Um, so again, it's also it's it's all of those processes of thinking of who's actually conducting the research elsewhere, like similar research who's doing the research and often you'll find that um, when it comes to uh, people of color uh, indigenous um, black and people of uh, and other people of color that um, often the research is not actually being done by people from off the communities themselves and someone else is telling their story so being aware of all of those issues around the story itself that's being told um, when you decolonize your mind, the next pillar is the voice, like issues around recognizing um, that you're not there to give um, to give voice to people, right? Um, often people talk about, I want to go into these communities and I want to make sure I, I want to give voice, I want to help people. So this like the helping narrative and this idea of I'm here to give you a voice. Well, I'm here to tell you that you don't need to give anybody a voice. Nobody needs you to give them a voice because everybody has a voice, right? What's actually missing uh, are speaking positions or, or people who listen. So like I said in the beginning, our job as researchers is to go in and actively listen before we actually um, talk ourselves or before we actually uh, start to do stuff so it's really thinking about what does it mean to actually um, help in the creation of speaking positions because often the whole idea is um, people don't have the the mic they haven't been handed over the mic which commands an audience and that's what we're here to tell uh, to do um, and remembering um, as well that where possible let people tell their own stories in the context of phds this, this can be quite challenging because of, obviously you can't you know people can't write your thesis for you um, but one of the things that i've done in some of my presentations as well has been to actually um, present the audio recordings like de-identified audio recordings of people so people can like your audience can actually hear the person themselves speak so all of that energy and all of that you know um, um, emotion or anything actually comes out when people tell their own stories um, the next concept really is about thinking about the concepts themselves that we're using in our work right so when you um, decolonizing yourself is to think about well hang on when I'm using these concepts a lot of them are actually Western science based concepts and so what does it mean for example to say I co-designed this research right the communities that are work that you're working with first of all do they actually even think in terms of code design right because a lot of the times i say to people now tell me what code design uh, how it how what word code design is in my language it doesn't exist right so it means that you need to ask us what to collaborate means or what to co-design that project is so just because we say we've co-designed the project when we've gone in with predetermined questions predetermined you know um methodologies predetermined you know everything else is predetermined and then we ask a few questions and we say we've co-designed um doesn't actually mean that we're doing um, anything other than perpetuating current systems and structures of power. So really thinking carefully around those issues um, of the concepts themselves um, that are often Western focused in their nature. And the last thing, I know I'm going a bit over time, so I'm rushing. The last thing to think about really is the audience um, that you're writing for. Um, who am I telling this story for? Um, as PhD students and sometimes as postdoctoral um, researchers or early career researchers, often we're, we're writing to um, quite a, a, a small audience. Um, I guess your PhD, you're also you're writing, I guess, to your examiners because <laughs> they're going to be the people that I read that read your thesis to start off with. Um, but it's being careful. Um, and also having that reflective thinking of um, 
what does it mean to write to a particular audience? And a lot of the times, um, work that is being done is actually the audience aren't actually the people that are being researched. The audience who are the colonized, the audience uh, usually the colonizers. And so um, there's a particular, um, the, that means that there's that perpetuation again and that reproduction of, or, or that, um, yeah, the reproduction of the inequalities and the oppression when you actually are still focusing on the oppressed but only to tell the story to the to the oppressor anyway um an example that i always give if, um, is to think about say you know those plan international or some of those like um adverts on tv the ngos that are targeted at um raising money for um so-called you know people in the in in the developing nations or in the poorer nations um and you think about the, the, the way, so for example, if you think about the, any of those that have ever depicted African women, you will know, you'll notice that the woman never talks. Um, there's always like the, some voice over and they usually have like um, a load of firewood on their head with the baby on their back and they're looking downtrodden and, and stuff like that. And so that narrative is being told the audience isn't the African woman herself, because if she told her story, she would not actually portray that kind of a woman. She would speak for herself and tell you what is going on in her life. So thinking through um, those um, what are what 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 are the dangers that I might actually fall into when I uh, focus on or play into uh, writing for the white gaze is, is very important. I think I'll stop there, Claire, because I know I've gone over time. Um, the next slide really was just about um, advising the um, uh, the website for no white saviors that I mentioned. Yes, I can share those details as well in the chat. Thank you, Virginia. As always, we could, I could just listen to you talk. Oh, it's just so great. And I think that was one of the early conversations we had about, you know, the importance of language. These aren't communities that are silent. They're communities that have been silenced. And so like those little things when we're writing, when we're speaking about those, about these communities, those things are really important. So thank you for highlighting that. That, that was, that was fantastic. Um, Vanessa, well, Dr. Vanessa, we're going to, we're going to jump to you now, if you're ready to go. So, Kapa Mugibithanga, Debe Dim, Kake Vanessa, Alaswa Bama people of the Eastern Cook and Yolanji Nation. Alaswa. So, good morning, everyone. My name is Vanessa. I'm going to talk about um, just following on from Virginia. I'm moving out of the talking about yourself to talking about um, decolonizing research as an institutional level. Okay, so looking at some of Smith's stuff, Linda Smith's stuff, now decolonization is, if you, if you, sorry, a pupumism or indirect word that only describes the formal handling over the instruments of governments, which in, re in reality must be a long-term process involving the cultural, linguistic and psychological divesting of colonial parameters. Now, what the, what does that mean? How do we then break that down further in decolonization? And I, and I think I just, I like the words of um, Martin Nakata uh, and where he talks about, um, you know, bringing in indigenous knowledges into that decolonization. And what I've got here on my slide is where I've talked about how Linda Smith continues with colonialism is far from being unfinished business. As all too often, we continue he to hear the reference of alienating with other and unequal power of defining. And we've seen that in research in colonization for centuries. When we look at Darwinism and the way that Darwinism selected people, identified them and labeled them. And that whole colonial process of putting in a Western structure onto indigenous cultures and communities and peoples. Because what it brought with it in that colonization and in that the power of defining and that othering was also that um, the taking away of, of sovereignty and governance, specifically in data. And what we saw was that 
um, people were suddenly, suddenly categorised and itemised and labelled Indigenous people, Indigenous knowledges, Indigenous understandings and worldviews. Completely disempowering, discriminating and taking away people's self-determination. So in actual fact, that, that whole process brought with it, and it came with it in, in that whole um, process of, of colonisation. And, and what we see that is in, in the institutions, in universities today, we see that imperialism is embedded in disciplines of knowledge and traditions as regimes of truth. We see all too often how indigenous cultures and knowledges have been palm to the side. We see that imperialism is, is about taking full control of Indigenous knowledges. It's about disregarding Indigenous knowledges, in, disregarding Indigenous science, disregarding Indigenous cultures. And when we look at I'm just going to go back to talking about governance and, and sovereignty because when we look at governance and sovereignty and culture, it was never about an individual. It was always about the collective. Indigenous people is about the collective. It's about collective rights and interests in our knowledges. It's about understanding who we are and where we come from in that space of Indigenous knowledges. So that part of decolonisation my slide isn't working, bear with me, there it is. It's about realising that the complexities in presenting Indigenous perspectives and in the indoctrination, oh, now it's working, sorry. There we go. Complexities in presenting Indigenous perspectives and indoctrination of Indigenisation into Western institutions is one of the biggest challenges that our generations have faced. Because all too often we look at that indigenization as, as tokenism. And we get people who stand up, or universities or institutions who stand up and say that they're decolonizing their institution when in fact they're just tokenistic and there is no understanding of what it is to bring forward indigenous knowledges and perspectives. We need to move beyond tokenism and start recognising and including elements of, it, of meaningful change practices and structures of what it is to be Indigenous, Indigenous cultures, Indigenous ways of doing, knowing and being, Indigenous knowledges. However, one of the biggest issues that we seem to face is like Nakata is saying, like colonisation, the Indigenous knowledge enterprise seems to be to have everything and nothing to do with us. Because quite often what we see across disciplines is that the interest is not just in Indigenous knowledges, it's actually is driven by capitalism, whereby Indigenous knowledge is seen as another source of potential profit, resulting in the fragmentation of Indigenous knowledges, ignoring again that collective rights and interest in Indigenous knowledges. If we are truly to decolonise, we have to recognise that Indigenous knowledge is a standpoint theory. We have to recognise that Indigenous knowledge is something that was here for tens of thousands of years. For Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, Indigenous knowledges have been around for 60,000, 80,000 odd years. It's knowledge that has survived climate, climate, climatization. It's survived environmental issues and it continues to have an ecological footprint in society. The intersection of the Western and Indigenous domains is known as the cultural interface. And this comes from Nakata again, and it is here where the lived experience plays a key role in developing new knowledge 
both Indigenous and non-Indigenous. And what that means is like, you know, the reality is we can't go back and say, you know, you know, colonizers, please go back to where you came from. Because people are here and we are transients, populations. And so it's about working together. It's about that cultural interface where we bring Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, knowledges, Indigenous knowledges together with Western knowledges. What does that look like? How do we do that? How do we make sure that we use, we include Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with lived experience, Indigenous people around the globe with the lived experience? How do we ensure that we are actually, how do we ensure that we are actually being culturally appropriate? That Indigenous knowledges, Indigenous theories, Indigenous cultures, are part of that doctrine in, 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 in Western universities. Because until that change happens, we're going to continue to see the social injustices and the inequality and the racism. The racism stems out. And so well, every time we say that a, a, an institution or, or a government or a, or a person is being racist, we need to go back and think about well, where did they come from? Where did they do their degree? Where did they study? Where did they go to school? Why isn't that place decolonized? Because they're the very institutions that we need to start with. I'm going to provide you with an example now. Oh, I think my screen stopped. There it is. Are we still screen sharing? Yep, thank you. I'm just showing, going to share with you an example of institutional change that I did it. Um, I implemented at University of Sydney with the STAR. Um, this came about because colonisation left in an equitable, racist and discriminative footprint. Indigenous youth suicides are five times that of non-Indigenous people. Indigenous, experience, Indigenous people experience a burden of disease 2.3 times that rate of non-Indigenous people. Over on my left hand side of the screen, you can see the history of Indigenous content and how the Faculty of Health Sciences, which is now the School of Health Sciences, actually tried but didn't know how to. Um, I'm not saying that they've got it perfect, okay? All I'm doing is showing you an example and where I come into this. And Indigenous higher ed having Indigenous culture and Indigenous knowledges in higher education is fundamental in decolonizing institutions. So how do we do it? We piloted in health sciences. It came from an executive level, a top-down approach, as well as a bottom-up approach with the dean support. It came from across the university. The university at a top level employed the first DBC Indigenous strategy and support in any university in the world, actually. And we did it here in Sydney. Um, and then the dean supported it within the faculty level. And the fact that we actually had um, all, this, all the specialty areas in health sciences became champions and, and were part of the implementation. It wasn't just about having me as an Indigenous person implementing Indigenous knowledges to decolonise the structure. It was actually about having the, the whole of staff trained in kinship training. The, uh, the education discipline actually developed a kinship training online tool. We piloted it with the, with the staff. It's now become compulsory for people to have that training. We have disciplined champions that people actually met with me. We created surveys, we, create, we, we have outcomes, we evaluated our process. We have key Indigenous outcomes in our faculty plan and now it has become part of the university plan. It's become you know, the part of the university graduate attributes. Non-Indigenous staff undertaking training to improve cultural safe attitudes and behaviour is continuous. Funding discipline collective Indigenous projects across faculties is, has become continuous. So we're a lot further away from where we started. Now I came onto, onto this program in 2011. What I showed you in the slide before, in the previous slide, was where the university was up to. The Faculty of Health Sciences 
at that point, which is, you know, now the Faculty of Health and Medicine as a whole. That decolonisation is, is a continuous journey. We're not at an end point. It's about understanding cultural competence. It's about being culturally safe. It's about ensuring that when an Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander person or an Indigenous person or another person of colour speaks, that their voices are heard. We are no longer the invisible population. It's about making sure that culture is part of who we are and part of integration of where we stand at decolonisation and decolonising the institution. Because until we get to that point of making sure that decolonising the institution, then we start to see that embedding out into research. And we've started seeing that in health sciences and then the Faculty of Medicine. Um, and I see it all the time. I've seen a massive shift come across in the way that staff actually work with Indigenous knowledges now. I don't see staff standing there saying, trying to be, you know, the be all and end all. I actually see people patiently saying, you know, okay, let's, let's do this. How do we do this? So it's, it's that institution level that changes it at the research level. The steps are slow and it will be a long time going. However, we've started to change and that's that process of decolonization at an institution level. So decolonization methodologies becomes an embedded theory into Western knowledges, but developed by indigenous people with the lived experience, as well as that, that qualification. So we see that cultural interface right at the forefront of decolonizing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vanessa. That was really fantastic to hear about sort of these ripple effects that have taken place you know, over the number of years that you've been sort of working with this with this program. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. That was really fantastic. Um, Ruth, we'll go over to you now if you're ready. Greetings from Brisbane. Before I continue, I would like to acknowledge the Yugambeh peoples on whose country I'm presenting from via Zoom today. And thank you, Claire, for the invitation and to my fellow panelists, Virginia, Vanessa and Sunshine for joining me to converse about the significance of decolonizing methodologies. Also, many thanks to everyone who has come online to hear our voices. Malo Alpito. Before I start to answer the key questions that were posed, I would like to position myself. My positionality as a researcher plays a big part in shaping my research work and how I am speaking with you today. As with many of you, we operate within several spaces in our daily lives and it's only to be expected that as you take up research work, you continue to live and operate within these spaces as mums, as daughters, as sisters, as Tongan Pacific, which, which I am, Tongan and Pacific and New Zealand born. So as, as Claire introduced me earlier, there were a, not, a number of things listed next to my name. So it is important to know who we are and where we come from in order to understand the significance of why we are here. And I'm here on Yugambia land, so there's been a journey. Um, so who am I? I am Ruth Lute Faleolo. My legal name is Ruth a biblical name given by my Christian parents, and Lute is the Tongan translation of this name that I use in the brackets, that I'm also called by my relatives and friends who know me well. I'm of Tongan descent, born and raised in Tamaki Makoto, Auckland, uh, New Zealand, and I was raised by Reverend Ahoy and Lossi Layu, my parents, who were migrants from Tongatapu Island in the 1970s to New Zealand under the Muldoon era seasonal work. And today I'm now married to a beautiful Samoan man and together with our children, we recently migrated to Australia and settled in Brisbane on Yugambi country. And we came here in pursuit of higher education and better opportunities for our children's future. So in relation to the first question, what does decolonizing methodologies mean to me? I would like to say that the first two women brilliantly wrapped that all up for me and answered it. <laughs> but, but there are two things that stand out from the first and second speaker today about reflexivity and the deconstructing or the unpacking or the 
um, unlearning of structures that have been placed upon us as academics. Um, as a Tongan woman coming across in 2015, first time meeting my supervisors at the University of Queensland, I found that I was speaking another language sometimes. I was talking about Pacifica this and Pacifica that, and I could see the, the eyebrows raised um, from the people sitting across the table wondering what on earth is she talking about? And I had to unpack that concept that day. And that's when they learned the word Pacifica at the University of Queensland. That professor decided, oh, that sounds like an interesting topic. Let's take you on. And a year later, I moved over with my family and I found that I was using the word Pacifica and there were already Pacifica student um, groups on the campus. So it made me wonder why these professors may not have even come across the word Pacifica, even though a lot of their students were part of a, a group on campus using the word. So it made me think um, that a lot of the times as a Pacific researcher, we had the assumption that people knew what we were talking about. So yeah, that was a good experience on so my first entry into the University of Queensland, coming across from New Zealand where that word is used quite readily and, and, and it even came up out of Auckland where I studied in the 1990s, the word Pacifica. It's a transliteration of the word Pacific, but in a island spelling with the K in there. And it was our way in the 90s of saying, this is us, we're here. And I know that my tutors and lecturers at the time in the 1990s were the uh, 20 years generation earlier generation of the um, Dawn Raids people who had been raided by the New Zealand government at the time because they were supposedly overstayers and then the Black Panther movement in America kind of came across to Auckland around that time. So the word Pacifica came out or was born out of a need to say we're here. We're at the university level now and we're not going anywhere. And so I've been born out of that, um, having studied in the 90s under tutors and lecturers of that era, coming across to Australia and then having to explain what Pacifica means was a bit of, bit of a task and I had to be humble about that. So yeah, it was understanding that I was working within spaces where we weren't always defined we weren't acknowledged and it's been an, a good experience actually and five years on I've finished the PhD and I've done a trans-Tasman study of Pacifica migrant um, well-being and so from this study a lot of literature now has been published from this and what I'd like to talk about is the concepts of Talanoa and Va that have uh, been used a lot in New Zealand spaces in Aotearoa but not so much here in Australia and so I've talked about this in my recent uh, recent publications in a way to decolonize the way methodologies are here in this space and it's quite a new space for Pacific researchers like myself. There are only a few others that are, are publishing on Pacifica experiences here in Australia so uh, I hope you guys don't mind that I'm now taking parts of work that has already been published to share with you today. So the use of two widespread research concepts that originate from my Tongan culture is Dala Noa and Va. And Va has been shortened from a phrase, Dauhi Va. And these two concepts are currently being used by several Pacific studies, especially in the circles um, um, Melanesian, Polynesian, Micronesian, and even those terms, the, the concepts don't really mean anything to us Pacific people anyway, um, but let's move on. Pacific Island worldviews are largely focused on relationship building and maintaining good social relationships, which is VA, to maintain, to keep the relationship. Therefore, researching within Pacific context requires the full engagement of the researcher during interviews and observations, seeking to understand both verbal and non-verbal language used within Pacific contexts. 
therefore reciprocal respect is important when undertaking research within our context. Talanoa is a preferred methodology, which, which is an ongoing free-flowing conversation, a narrative approach. It's a preferred methodology within Pacific research contexts because it nurtures social spaces by embracing cultural protocol. And although Dalanoa is simply defined by a lot of researchers I've seen in their description of it as free-flowing conversation, it involves storytelling, thoughts and feelings, the sharing of thoughts and feelings, not just one way from the informant or participant, but two way between the researcher and the informant. Um, it is a way of collecting Pacific knowledge that should be undertaken within a deeper, with a deeper understanding of these social spaces in which Dalanoa occurs and of how it is best done. For instance, when speaking with family leaders, uh, church leader or community leader, there are expected and respectful ways that a Pacific researcher should be addressed, uh, sorry, that a researcher should be dressed to address this person and, and there should be a certain way that they provide information about themselves, making linkages, genealogical linkages usually. And this is all done before they conduct any conversation about anything related to the research. And this is a culturally appropriate way. Kaili, um, a Hawaiian, and also I think he's now based in Arizona, Arizona-based researcher, Tongan researcher, maintains that Embracing relationality in research means to apply socio-spatial and other behavior rules of relating to people, spaces, and their knowledge in a culturally responsive and appropriate way, which again, it supports what, um, what you guys have focused your panel on today. This is important to understand when researching Pacific peoples because they view reciprocal relationships as social spaces needing to be nurtured. So the whole time you're conversing with someone, there's a desire within Pacific people to nurture that space between you two. So the concepts of dauhiva or to maintain this relationship in Pacific research means to nurture social relationships. So the significance of va, which is the space between two people, is in the act of maintaining these spaces. So therefore, it is my personal understanding that this maintaining of social spaces should be an ongoing action within the research practice itself, not just during the conversation. Um, when you're analyzing their interview scripts, when you're considering what words they had used, there needs to be some sort of respectful behavior towards that. So therefore, on entering Dalanoa or any communication with Pacific peoples, the object of it should be to maintain social spaces and relationships. There is an important link between Va and Dalanoa, whereby Dalanoa allows for this meaningful communication built on shared obligations. In other words, participation in a conversation of Dalanoa obligates researchers not only to gather information, but also to provide information, like I mentioned earlier. And the process of Dalanoa then is two-way, a giving and a receiving of knowledge. Um, therefore, information reciprocity in Dalano is essential to maintaining these spaces, these spaces, social spaces. Researchers working and living within Pacific contexts must bear in mind then that there are codes of speaking, dressing, and behaving that build into the maintenance of relational spaces. According to Ponson, this specific methodology takes into consideration the values and beliefs required by all stakeholders. So there is a growing concern, though, amongst Pacific academics that relates to the misapplication of the Dala Noor research method. And I've noticed that the UN likes to use, in some of their talk series, the Dala Noor approach, and it's been misapplied. Um, furthermore, there is a call for more thorough academic thought and discussion given to the etymology and meanings of indigenous methodologies like Delanoa. I agree with this stance, as it will only strengthen the validity and the reliability of Pacific research processes and outputs. Um, however, when dismantling complex research constructs and concepts, one needs to remember that these have developed layers over both of both strengths and weaknesses over the years of conception, development, application, and redefining. So whenever you are dismantling some sort of complex research construct, I would recommend that any Pacific method or methodological approach be used with intermittent pauses or moments of pause and reflection 
Um, the reflective practice that was mentioned by our first speaker today is important that reflective practice of Pacific and non-Pacific researchers alike will ensure that the true essence of methods like Dalanoa uh, will be used as they were originally intended. For example, Dalanoa was um, brought about by Halapu and Violati, and these concepts were meant for certain contexts and to achieve certain um, communication agreements between groups, so, sometimes political, sometimes just social cultural. And it's important that we keep the essence of these methods and approaches true. Uh, the realignment of research agendas and the use of Dalanoa, for example, will ensure that safe relational spaces for knowledge sharing are nurtured by respectful relationships and meaningful dialogue. When the Dalanoa approach is used purely as a method of just gaining access to knowledge rich spaces, the narrow motives of the researcher will, will be all too evident to most Pacific informants. Although many of them would be too polite to let you know this directly, they do read you quite clearly. And the information gathering exercise will not be as effective in nurturing a two way free flow dialogue. So, in some cases, informants may choose not to give their honest opinions. Um, may use the words, oh, it's, uh, it's a bit complicated, or, or it's a long story. And um, this is usually as a result of maybe an inbuilt mistrust or disrespect shown by researchers who may not be complying with these unwritten rules of Pacific sociocultural protocols, based, which is usually based on reciprocity. So that's the significance of the Dano approach, is that it can help, though, to create and build spaces of empowerment for both researcher and informants if done well. Any research tool is effective and powerful in the right hands with the right motives at heart. If a researcher has a deep understanding of the core values that they are working within, for example, the Pacific cultural values of reciprocal respect, whakapa'apa, whakapa'alo, and the skills to implement these values in ways that are both appropriate to the given cultural context and meaningful to meaningful to the people involved, then Dalinor can be useful as a method of building beautiful social spaces, as well as expanding the researchers and informants philosophical knowledge spaces through ongoing dialogue. Personally, my research seeks to clarify and to keep developing Dalinor as a research tool and as an overarching approach to all beliefs and principles. Does that mean I'm finished? Um, there's like a, a woman speaking to me in a robotic voice. <laughs> oh, I'm not sure what that is, Ruth, but uh, yes, that's just a bit over 10 minutes. If that's, um, if you're done, that would be great for you to wrap yeah. up. Yeah, so Thank I'm you. just wrapping up now. Um, yeah, so just reflexivity is something that I think is vital in any research practice and it, and it will help to cultivate methodologies that promote social spaces that are positive and nurturing of the people that we are working with. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ruth. That was fantastic. It's really um, great to hear you talk about the obligations and the expectations that, you know, the different communities that we work in, you know, these unwritten mm -hmm. rules that we really need to acknowledge and we need to understand when we go into these communities and, and make sure that we're constantly um, aware of that throughout the, the research project uh, process. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much. Let's, um, let's jump over to Sunshine. Sunshine, whenever you're ready, we'd love to hear from you. Thanks, Claire. I will just share my screen quickly. Can everybody see that? Okay. Um, so thank you, Claire, and thank you, Virginia, Vanessa, and Ruth. I'm so happy to be with all of you today. Um, I would like to first begin by acknowledging the Bunwarang people of the Kulu Nations um, as the traditional owners and custodians of the land upon which I live and create. I recognize their continuing connection to land, um, water and culture, I pay my, my respects to their elders, present, past, present and emerging, for they hold the memories, the traditions, the culture and the hope of their people. So June 2020 was by far one of the most challenging months for me as an African black woman living in a predominantly white society. 
what many were dealing with the pandemic and all the ways it had changed the way we live, I was grappling with something that had hit far much closer to home, an identity crisis of sorts. In addition to the pandemic, I had to unpack what was happening in the United States with the death of George Floyd and the aftershocks that followed in its wake that were felt by Black people all over the world. I realized that I had been living a lie. I socialized with white people. I worked in a predominantly white space where I tried to hold on to my integrity and my values of racial equity, but I couldn't escape the racial microaggressions of racial inequity. And also the jokes made by people around me who either claimed ignorance or good fun as a defense. I consented to explaining for the millionth time why my hair looked different every month or so. And no, you cannot touch my hair became a song that I grew too tired to sing anymore. I did not speak up when I was uncomfortable with what was said by the water cooler about people who looked like me for fear of being labeled too sensitive or too angry. I had been called and labeled a black woman, an angry black woman before, and it was a label I did not wish to wear ever again. So I kept my anger hidden and out of view. I had become complicit in my own oppression. So I wanted to start here because I want to illustrate hopefully through my presentation today that the life cycle of the researcher of color is part and parcel of the process of decolonizing methodologies and how that in itself is actually a continuous process that bleeds into every area of our lives. It is nuanced and very complex and capturing that complexity is critical to understanding the process of unsettling and unpacking the research process itself. So one of the key problems of the Eurocentric and colonial ideologies is this obsession with linearity, the idea that everything is moving in one direction and towards the same goal and ultimate conclusion, which I argue is whiteness. And when I talk about whiteness, I'm specifically referring to Meza's definition of whiteness, which I have on the slide there. So whiteness is a, as a way of thinking, doing, and being. This is in fact a very, very vivid contrast to actual reality, which is A, the diversity that is the world, and B, there is actually nothing linear. Life and experience is a series of movements, so forwards, backwards, sideways, crisscrossing, and creating a labyrinth that cannot be known by simply looking at things from the outside, or as a researcher separate from the actual field of research. So the nuance of my experience as a black woman who studies race, difference and bodies is what initially compelled me to begin to decolonize research methodology, methodologies in the first place. I wanted to capture, understand and articulate the disruptions I was experiencing on a daily basis as I moved along the proverbial linear path towards full acceptance into Australian society, also known as whiteness. I received pushback at the time of my PhD, which is around 2011 to 2015, from the postgraduate coordinator in my department for choosing a methodology he termed fluffy and unscientific. I wanted to emphasize the body's experience of racial encounters by cataloging its emotions, feelings, thoughts, and actions. I was drawn to reflexivity and a feminist ethnographic and phenomenological approach. Therefore, I wrote about my everyday experiences in Every day in ordinary spaces to not only make sense of them and provide a first hand account of what it means to be a black body in Australia, but to also speak back to power and to destabilize the conveyor belt of Eurocentric discourse around belonging. But back to the cycle. When I finished my PhD, I had gained a wealth of knowledge about research on the process of decolonizing concepts and ideas, grounding them in context, historical, sociological, cultural, economic, and dare say the dreaded political. I also learned how to synthesize the results into language that could be communicated and understood broadly, not just academically. I had hoped to change the world with my research, as is the dream of every PhD 
student at some point in their PhD. That hasn't happened yet. But what did happen was that I left academia feeling slightly confident about who I was and my place in society. I knew it would be hard, but I didn't expect it to be that hard. I got a job in higher education and I experienced all over again the process of colonization. But this time I could better track what was happening. Those moments where women of color are forced to internalize their racist experiences, where they're told things like, you're the one reading into the situation. You're probably just imagining things. As a researcher, I found observing my own recolonization fascinating, but as a woman of color, it was so crushing and very exhausting. While the challenges of navigating white spaces and fields of existence weren't new to me, these were much more nuanced. I briefly want to touch on two examples of challenges that I have faced, um, and the first one being credibility. As a black woman, I found I had no credibility to advocate for myself because I was already starting from a premise that was questionable. For example, reporting occurrences in the office space that made me feel singled out as a minority were often met with suspicion and doubt. The space had a particular trajectory, energy and texture of being. And again, here I'm specifically talking about whiteness. And because I didn't fit or I disrupted the flow by pointing out that my experience was different, my own experience was then set up as the thing that was wrong. It had to be a failing on my part and not the space. Research has historically shown that there is a, this is a common reaction to people of color sharing their racial experiences with white people. Non-racial explanations are often used to explain racial events. This disempowers the victim by taking away their right to see and name racial injustice. Any knowledge or discourse that does not support or uphold the structure of whiteness as the norm is usually stripped of its credibility. This process is not only happening at the macro level, but it's happening in our intimate interactions, in the gyms, in the shops, in academic offices, etc. I was amazed at how often I was criticized for not participating in Australian traditions that made me uncomfortable precisely because of the culture around them, yet was still blamed for being too sensitive, for pointing out why I didn't want to participate. It was a vicious cycle in which I was damned if I did and damned if I didn't. The second challenge I face is mobility and credibility affects mobility. Without a stamp of approval from whiteness or the purveyors of whiteness, it is impossible for women of color to move up in a white dominated space. I knew this intellectually, I had done the research, but it was a different experience to actually watch how easily my white colleagues were progressing in their careers and how much they got support for their ideas and projects. The argument was that their projects and idea was, were more in line with the organization's vision. The other argument was that I needed to speak up more. I needed to fight for my place, both of which are standard advice, but impossible to action in the structure of whiteness. This inevitably leads to women of color feeling the pressure to work 10 times harder than their colleagues just to prove a point. And I had to do that. I was told many times that in order to move up, I had to be proactive. But what I came to realize was that, was that this, this was a particular type of proactiveness and it involved being white or performing whiteness and not being sensitive about microaggressions, not questioning power or the way things were done, even when that power was making your work life miserable at best and at worst had its knee on your neck. I watched myself become a statistic of black women who don't progress in their career, not because they're not qualified or hardworking, but because they fail to play the game of making themselves small and accepting racist, such a racist treatment as part of the texture of white spaces and as part of achieving success. These women fail to appease whiteness and to navigate white spaces for a prolonged period of time. Watching myself turn into a statistic startled me because I thought I knew better. I was a researcher. I had studied women like myself, but there I was absolutely failing at the ability to bridge the gap between academic research 
and lived experience, which in my opinion should always be the goal of research. Sorry, my slides are. So the reason I share these experiences is basically to argue one point. Um, and I, I think I'm coming full circle from where Virginia started from. And my point is that one of the first steps to decolonizing methodologies is to decolonize ourselves as researchers. In fact, for many black women researchers, decolonizing methodologies cannot be divorced from the process of decolonizing ourselves. This should be an ongoing process for both white researchers and researchers of color because to be able to challenge power and Eurocentric views and linear representations of the world requires a grounded experience in our own intimate unraveling. It is asking ourselves the hard questions. How am I propping up white supremacist ideals and structures? In what ways am I compromising and contributing to the status quo? I believe this work of decolonizing ourselves is in fact much harder than decolonizing methodologies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sunshine. If, if people in attendance today have not read Sunshine's book, Understanding Racism in a Post-Racial World, it will rock your boat. So please um, check, out, check it out. It's really, really a fantastic book and it, and it really touches on so many things that she presented today. So thank you so much for that, Sunshine. It's fantastic. Um, okay, we're going to sort of go to some Q&A now. We've got about hopefully 10 minutes or so um, to get to some Q&A. We had a couple of questions come up in the chat box. One of them, Ruth, I think was for you. It is, what is the name of the methodology that you were talking about? Maybe you could just type that into the, the chat box for us, because I definitely can't remember how to pronounce it. <laughs> so you're on, you're, on, um, you're on mute, Ruth. Do you mind just unmuting? Yeah. Oh, we're having some tech issues. Yeah, Ruth, if you could just put that in the chat box for us. I think that question sure. was for you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's Tala Noa and Dauhiva, but I'll pop that in now. Thanks. Thank you, Ruth. Um, we also have an earlier question from Jack. I think this is when you were chatting Virginia, so possibly is to you. Um, he's written, if voices are influenced, whose voice are we hearing? Can you maybe just dive into a little bit of a, a response to that one? Um, okay, I'm not sure what, um, was it David or Jack? Jack. Um, Jack, um, what you um, mean by if voices are influenced, I guess, um, uh, for me, the influ um, being the influ influence comes from um, quite a lot of um, places, and I, I, I talked about positionality because for me, that's um, a lot of the ways in which we're influenced by our surrounding. Right, so um, a lot of the voices that I heard aren't the voices of um, the people of color, as my fellow panelists have, have talked about. Um, I guess very very clear the voices that i heard are the voices of those that have power um and those voices that have power are influenced like i said by their own positionality which comes from um privilege whether it's racial privilege or gendered or whatever um types of privilege that they have um so people we don't hear the voices because they're the ones that need to be heard. We hear voices because they're the ones that have the power, that they're the ones that have the speaking position, they're the ones that have um, the microphone. I always like to um, use the word microphone and Claire knows this because for me it's always like um, if we're standing in a crowd um, and someone has the microphone, whoever has the microphone is the one that actually is heard the most. Um, and to me, when it comes to like whose voices is heard, it depends on who's holding the microphone and the microphone is always held um, with the person that has the most power. And part of um, really decolonizing ourselves is understanding that fact, that is a social fact, that not everybody has equal access to that microphone. And just because someone is holding the microphone doesn't mean that they, um, you know, uh, they're speaking for everybody and that there's some voices out there that are actually not being heard just because they're not holding the microphone. So for me, the, um, I don't know if that answers your question, Jack, the voices that we're hearing 
are essentially those of the people that have the microphone. Thank you, Virginia. Um, I, I hope that answers the question. Let us know in the chat box if, if you want any follow up on that one, Jack. Um, we also have a question here from Sarah, who's part of the TARS MEM postgrad team. She said that she loved hearing your perspectives on, um, on from today, and she's wondering how, how students and really all future researchers might navigate the tensions between some of the criteria that, you know, we have to meet for traditional ethics applications, for instance, um, and the structures that can challenge efforts to acknowledge and empower participant voices to build relationships and approach participants as co-collaborators. You know, sometimes we have you know, these ideas when we go into the research process, but we're really hindered by some of these, you know, academic structures, such as the ethics protocols that we're required to meet. Did anyone on the panel maybe have a response to, to Sarah's question? Yeah, prioritizing integrity. Uh, you know, that's a big mandate in universities across the board. So integrity, it, under that, you should be able to um, argue that acknowledging participant voices and, and including them in co-authoring even papers and things like that, that should all be um, able to be pushed forward in ethics applications under the integrity of your research, um, making sure that you're culturally responsive and responsible, culturally responsible to the peoples that you're working with. Yeah, so I'd, I'd push for the integrity part of mandates in universities across all their structures and their systems where, where that's an important thing and um, sometimes that means pushing a little like for me just having to redefine what research looks like in the communities I was working in and and even using their own words in your applications for concepts that are meaningful to your participants yeah. Thank you Ruth I see um, Vanessa's raised her hand we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, so just adding on to what Ruth was saying about integrity, it's also um, reciprocity. Um, mm -hmm. Quite often you have to, I make a point now whenever I work with um, Indigenous or non-Indigenous people who are doing Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander or Indigenous or African women's research, it, it's what is that reciprocity? What are we giving back? It's not about, you know, giving back just a monetary fund or, or you know, like saying, oh, you know, we'll include you on a publication. It's actually about training people giving them education, saying, all right, so if we're going to go in there and we are going to say, look at um, um, the levels of chronic disease, how are we going to train the community to address those levels of chronic disease to keep the levels down? So it's part of that reciprocity. How are you going to do that and how are you going to reflect that in your ethics? Because that's really important. Because what that does is, is say that you're actually prepared to work with people of the lived experience of Indigenous people's knowledges as specifically Indigenous people. And, and don't be afraid to even set up things like um, um, a training partnership with a TAFE and include that in your, in your research. It can be very small. It doesn't have to be really big. It doesn't have to be overwhelming. We work, if you work in a university or an institution, what sort of pathway can you develop for that community that you're working with mm -hmm. or that young people or the older people to get them trained in one aspect of what you're doing and what you're studying so that reciprocity is real so when you walk away from that community or from those people or that piece of research somebody is picking it up indigenous people can take it on board and they can then 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 create something that is worthwhile for their community and they can keep moving forward and nobody is left behind so that reciprocity is really important as well Mm. Um, Thank you, Virginia. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's it, it's really hard sometimes. Um, a colleague of mine and myself, we published a paper uh, uh, quite a few years ago. Um, I, I don't know. It was I think it was Sage Open or something, um, and it was talking about a we called it a clash of paradigms. Um, like, um, and it was actually at that point not looking necessarily at doing research with um, uh, oppressed, um, historically oppressed groups, but it was just looking really at even like ethnographic research that's usually doesn't quite confirm to some of those requirements of um, ethics ethics boards in um, in within universities. And so we, I don't know if you can get that paper online, it would also be useful in terms of 
um, getting you to understand how we got around some of those issues and what some of our arguments were in terms of how um, ethics review boards actually um, you know prioritize all these things of objectivity and it's, it tends to be this kind of positivist approach to like really doing research and understanding research so sometimes it's just really um, knowing how ethics review boards actually run and what the um, the um, what they tend to kind of look at and then having to to navigate that and as um, Ruth and and Vanessa have said really staying through to your to um, like maintaining integrity so you can do your research maintaining integrity um, or with integrity because at the end of the day it's something yes that we have to navigate but we also have to um, to ensure that we're doing right by the communities that we're that we're researching because often um, you know historically oppressed groups they they often really like um, over researched and people go in with these western notions of understanding whatever issue it is and there's rarely a chance to really sit down with communities and actually try to co-create knowledge so we kind of go in as the knowers and we're the ones who hold all the knowledge and then they have to like um you know we have to like find some data from them and and but we we still see ourselves as the knowledge holders and by we i mean researchers so um yeah it is it is finding out the sort of the, the the points of contention with um ethics review boards oh thank you i don't know who put that in there but yeah the that paper in the um kind of talks about some of the ways in which we dealt with um that that clash of paradigms because that's what it is right like um the work that we do requires a different way of understanding what ethics are really and it's like um yeah <laughs> Um, which is quite different to the understanding of ethics review boards currently. Can I, can I just add, just, just to add on to what Ruth was saying, I think part of integrity is also honesty, if I can put it bluntly, like being able to capture the actual reality of the group that you're studying or the research, rather than couching the language, really capture what it is um, that's that's being researched so that it's spoken in the voice of the whether the, it's the group that you're researching or the actual phenomena um, because i think a lot of the pressure is around sounding like when you're you're writing it has to sound the way that it's historically should sound but rather than that really lean into um, capturing it as it is Thank you, Sunshine. Thank you, everyone, for those um, fantastic responses. I think that was sort of it for the questions um, in the, the chat box. So I might just start to um, formally formally close today. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for, for joining us for the session today. Um, obviously, an especially big thank you to our fantastic panel. Um, as a thank you gift for our panel today, we've actually made a donation to Seek Volunteers Australia, who are a migrant-run organisation that are providing free meals to disadvantaged people during lockdown. Um, we thought that given the current situation in, in Melbourne and Sydney, that this would be hopefully an eloquent way to say thank you um, to our panel by making this donation. So thank you so much for your time. A big thank you as well to African Women Australia um, for partnering with us on this event. I did put their website um, details in the chat box, but feel free just to Google them and become a member and find out what they're up to. It's a really incredible organisation. Uh, also, thank you to the rest of the MEM postgraduate team, uh, Sarah Barrage, Ying Wai Yu and Laura Simpson-Reeves for their support with this event. And thank you to Taza for the ongoing support with the funding. If you want to be kept in the loop for future MEM events, then please follow us on Twitter or sign up for our newsletter. Um, consider joining Taza and becoming um, part of our thematic group with all these incredible events. And finally, we will have another conversations about event uh, coming up in a couple months. I think it's looking at like October at this stage. So please uh, follow us on Twitter and we'll, we'll announce some of the details for that event. Um, if you would like any further details of this event, feel free to email me, claire.moran at monash.edu. Um, I'm happy to take any more questions. Um, but yeah, thank you once again to our fantastic panel and thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, stay safe and we hope to see you again at our next event.